with Stephen, and it's time for today's daily devotion with Pastor Graffiti Fellowship Church in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we've developed this tool just to help, just to provide uh, a little bit of support to, to make it easy as possible, to include a little bit of God's Word in your day, and some people might say, well, should it be easy? Isn't God's Word, our daily devotion time with the Creator of the universe, isn't it worth a little bit of work? Yes, of course. Uh, but you got to start somewhere. And uh, we found this is a great place to start, and it seems to be blessing some folks, and so that's why we do it. We read, the way this works is we read a chapter from the Bible each day. Uh, we post these videos five days a week. Organized playlists according to biblical book. We're working on our third such playlist now. It's the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Matthew, all 28 chapters are there. Gospel of uh, Mark, all 16 chapters are there. Uh, today we're reading Luke chapter 20, which means we're approaching uh, the end of Luke's Gospel. I think there are 24 chapters in Luke, if I remember right. <clears throat> and then we'll keep going. Where we are in the gospel narrative, we, we saw in the last video in chapter 19, uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he's, he's going to Jerusalem this time uh, to celebrate the Passover, but, but it's also what we now call the Passion Week. It's, it's the week, uh, the Holy Week. It's going to be the week um, where the Last Supper takes place during their Passover celebration. Uh, it's the week where um, Jesus is arrested, where he goes to a sham trial, where he's found guilty, where the people cry, crucify him, and, and, and then ultimately they do. All this is taking place this week. We're on the front side uh, of that week now, however, and uh, he's arrived in Jerusalem. He's cleared the temple. He's wept over the city. He knows, uh, he understands the state of things. Luke chapter 20 begins this way in verse 1. One day as Jesus was teaching the people, preaching the good news in the temple, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders came up to them and they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Let me ask you a question first, he replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven? Or was it merely human? And they talked it over amongst themselves. If we say it was from heaven... He'll ask why we didn't believe John. But if we say it was merely human, the people will stone us because they're convinced John was a prophet. And so they replied that they didn't know. And Jesus replied, Then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. Now Jesus turned to the people again and told them this story. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and moved to another country to live for several years. At the time of the grape harvest, he sent one of his servants to collect his share of the crop, but the farmers attacked the servant, beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. So the owner sent another servant, but they also insulted him, beat him up, and sent him away empty-handed. A third man was sent, and they wounded him and chased him away. What will I do? The owner asked himself. I know. I'll send my cherished son. Surely they will respect him. But when the tenant farmer saw his only son, they said to each other, Here comes the heir of the estate. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they dragged him out of the vineyard and murdered him. What do you suppose the owner of the vineyard will do to them, Jesus asked. I'll tell you. He'll come and kill those farmers and lease the vineyard to others. How terrible that such a thing should ever happen, his listeners protested. Jesus looked at them and said, then what does the scripture mean? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Everyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. The teachers of religious law and the leading priests wanted to arrest Jesus immediately because they realized he was telling this story against them. They were the wicked farmers, but they were afraid of the people's reaction. Watching for their opportunity, the leader sent spies pretending to be honest men, and they tried to get Jesus to say something that could be reported to the Roman governor so he would arrest Jesus. Teacher, they said, we know that you speak and teach what is right and are not influenced by what others think. You teach the way of God truthfully. Now tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through the trickery and said, show me a Roman coin. Whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's. 
Well then, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So they failed to trap him by what he said in front of the people. Instead, they were amazed by his answer and they became silent. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees. These are religious leaders who say there's no resurrection from the dead. And they pose this question, Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife but no children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children, so the second brother married the widow, but he also died. Then the third brother married her, and this continued with all seven of them who died without children. Finally, the woman also died. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, Marriage is for people here on earth, but in the age to come, those worthy of being raised from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and they'll never die again. In this respect, they will be like angels. They are children of God and children of the resurrection. But now, as to whether the dead will be raised, even Moses proved this when he wrote about the burning bush. Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died, he referred to the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he's not, he is God of the living, not the dead, for they're all alive to him. Well said, teacher, remarked some of the teachers of religious law who were standing there. And then no one dared ask him any more questions. Then Jesus presented them with a question. Why is it, he asked, that the Messiah is said to be the son of David? For David himself wrote in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Since David called the Messiah Lord, how can the Messiah be his son? And then with the crowds listening, he turned to his disciples and said, Beware these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplace. And how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets yet they shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. Because of this, they'll be severely punished. So Jesus is uh, stirring up controversy, as He is wont to do, um, but for the right reasons. And you see here the integrity that Jesus possesses contrasted with the lack thereof of these religious leaders. We see it at the very beginning of the chapter. Um, as these uh, as these religious leaders, they come and challenge Jesus. They say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gives you the right to do these things? And he answers their question with a question that they refuse to answer. Like, things are just true or they're untrue. And so they're weighing their answers. They're saying, oh, well, if we say this, then we'll trap ourselves. And if we say that will make the people mad and will lose their support. And so they chose to say, we don't know. That's a lie. And they're, they, they, they clearly lack integrity because their response to the question is not, what's, what's the true answer? It's, how can we win? How can we deceive our way into personal gain? And uh, that's, the, that's the rub, that's the, that's the conflict between Jesus and these so-called religious leaders. He calls them in the end of the chapter, he says, you pretend to be pious, that means you pretend to be really holy, but you're not. In fact, when we pretend to be holy and we're not, we're actually the very opposite of pious. We're actually the very opposite of holy. And only by making Jesus king of our lives can, uh, can we begin to grow in personal holiness. Thanks so much for participating in Luke chapter 20. Hope you've been blessed. And I hope you'll join us again uh, next time for Luke chapter 21 as we kind of go into the home stretch toward finishing the gospel of Luke. God bless you.